On the 25th of September, another attack was launched under the direct command of the battalion commander, which tore an opening in the Soviet lines and enabled a connection with the elements to the north near Gaitolovo. At 12.30, the battalion entered Gaitolovo. The battalion commander, Hauptmann Schmidt, had accomplished this feat only through the use of his extraordinary leadership skills, combined with his personal bravery in the face of overwhelming enemy strength. For this accomplishment, he was subsequently recommended to be awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, and he did receive this highly esteemed decoration on the 8th of October. The capture of Gaitolovo instilled within the ranks the attitude that once again they could accomplish almost any feat asked of them. It was widely believed that no intact enemy elements remained between the division and the forward elements of Regiment 437. The enemy did, however, succeed in opening a salient between the right wing of the regiment and Infantry Regiment 436 on the 25th of September that could not be closed due to the weakening of Regiment 436. At this time, the division should not have received further assignments, as all troops had reached the point of exhaustion from which no movement was possible. The Soviets obviously faced the same situation, and despite all attempts, the attacks to win the two kilometres held by our regiment were unsuccessful. On the 26th of September, the division received another order to attack. The order was given to throw the enemy back over the Tchernaya and to hold the sector in order to establish a bridgehead from where our forces could close any openings torn through our lines. The weakened units were again unable to carry out the assignment against the heavily entrenched enemy. A further attempt was made on the 27th of September, and Infantry Regiment 437 managed to reach the former Russian command bunker 500 metres to the east of the Chernaya Bridge, where they dug in and waited for the inevitable counterattack. With no support from either of our flanks, the embattled regiment could not prevent the Soviet forces from slipping past toward the west. The regiment continued to hold the position against heavy Soviet forces, while Russian units flowed past the island of resistance to attack the German lines. On the 30th of September, the 3rd Mountain Division launched an attack that relieved the beleaguered 437th Regiment, sealed the front on the flanks, and prevented an encirclement of the regiment. The losses suffered during these days were exceedingly high, to the extreme that the regiment was only strong enough to remain on the defensive, lacking the strength to break even minimal Russian resistance. From the 5th of October, the division was officially on the defensive, and on the 11th of October came the order for it to be replaced on the line by the 24th Infantry Division. The shocked and weakened troops turned the positions over to their relief columns and made their way to the rest positions in the area of Viritsa. During the fighting at Gaitolovo, our division's Catholic priest had earned the name the Rucksack Priest. He was constantly on the move with his worn field pack strapped to his back from which he consistently provided the troops on the foremost lines with simple food items that had come to be regarded by the Lanzas as luxuries. He was always willing to assist the wounded, and on one occasion he personally located and rescued a badly wounded soldier who had fallen to a sniper's bullet in an exposed position on the line. His constant exposure to the front and physical risks for the benefit of the soldiers came to an untimely end when he received a severe shrapnel wound to his arm. Inflicted by a Russian mortar fired from the dense forest several hundred metres distant, the wound was severe enough to require amputation of the limb. Thus the division lost a valuable soldier and friend. The division commander did attempt officially to recognise his numerous acts of bravery and dedication by recommending him for a high award. However, this recommendation was disapproved in light of the typical National Socialist philosophy which was to refuse to grant such an esteemed decoration unless the priest agreed to surrender his cloth and collar. During the weeks between the 22nd of September and the 7th of October, our battalion suffered a total of 62 killed, 280 wounded and 30 missing. Some 20 to 30 lightly wounded and sick remained with the battalion, leaving us with an effective strength of 50 combatants within the battalion. During a short rest period between October and December in the area of Viritsa, extreme measures were employed to rebuild the regiment. Supply units, pioneer platoons, transportation units and other units deemed not immediately critical 
were combed through in the search for available personnel to serve in the infantry. The desperate battle that had recently been fought south of Lake Ladoga had been costly, and no replacements were available from other sources. There was little or no formal training for our self-supplied reinforcements prior to the 28th of October, when the order was issued to move to a newly assigned sector of the Eastern Front in the area of the Pogostia Pocket. The winter months that followed brought little action, which offered the opportunity to train the recently assembled units and to recover strength until February. As early as February 1943, all units were again reported to be up to effective combat strength, despite the lack of extensive infantry training for replacement troops. Shortly after our division was sent into action for a renewed attack, I was wounded again. A ricochet or shell splinter had struck my left foot and had penetrated completely through the heavy leather boot, leaving jagged entrance and exit holes. Fortunately, the wound did not break any bones and appeared to be relatively superficial, indicating a swift recovery that would not require evacuation. While recovering in the regimental medical station, I received notice that I was scheduled for immediate departure to the war school. Just as during World War I, the casualty rate for junior officers had proven to be extremely high, following the Prussian motto, the life of a lieutenant is first to live and first to die. There existed within our regiment on the front no officers at the battalion or company level who had not been wounded, and many had fallen in action. It was a strangely uncomfortable feeling to see the homeland again, my orders took me to Lunaville, and from there to chaton sur marne where the Troop Replacement Command was located. Subsequent orders directed me to report to the war school in Milovitz, near Prague. As a reservist, which in the German army traditionally remained set apart from the regular or professional soldiers, I remained dedicated but not overly enthusiastic regarding my impending promotion to the officer corps. I was soon participating in the intensive classroom lectures and field problems, and due to my recent experience at the front, I was called upon by the instructors to brief the officer candidates on various situations to be encountered on the Eastern Front. Suddenly, and without warning, the wound on my foot opened, and I was forced to spend a period of three weeks in a local military clinic, where medical officers attempted to close the wound. Unlike the American army, at this time the German army possessed no penicillin, and an even insignificant wound might develop infections that could prove to be fatal if they could not be held in check. Indeed, even at this late date in medical developments, a stomach wound was commonly fatal, and before going into action the Lanzers were often advised to eat very little, as a full stomach would increase complications and could prove to be fatal if penetrated by a bullet or shrapnel. Throughout the period of time I remained immobilised in the clinic, I was frequently visited by officer candidate von Moltke, a descendant of our famous Prussian field marshal, who provided me with lesson plans and problems as they were presented in the class, so that I could remain current with the curriculum as it was taught. One afternoon Major Richter, our class commander, toured the clinic and stopped at my bedside to speak with me. I was surprised to hear him ask about the well-being of Oberst Kinsmiller, with whom he had previously served. While reviewing the files of the officer candidates, the Major had noticed that I had reported from Kinsmiller's command. Following World War I, they had both served together in the Freikorps during the political upheaval of the 1920. During his visit, he expressed concern that I would not be permitted to graduate with my class due to my prolonged absence. I then proceeded to show him the work I had been conducting throughout my convalescence, which pleased him immensely, and he departed after assuring me that he would attempt to intervene should my graduation and subsequent promotion be jeopardised because of my wound. On the 1st of December I became a Feldwebel and a Leutnant on the same day. On the 17th of December, the officer candidates of War School Class 11 were driven to Berlin, where we assembled at the Sportspalast to hear a speech by Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring. Approximately 2,000 newly commissioned officers from all branches of service were seated by the order of precedence of their combat decorations. As one of the students who had previously been awarded the Iron Cross First Class, I was given the honour of sitting in the front row, only several metres distance from the podium. Suddenly, to the deafening tunes of stirring military music, the Reichsmarschall appeared and approached the podium. 
His corpulent frame was clothed in a resplendent ivory-coloured uniform. At his neck hung the Grand Cross of the Iron Cross and the Poor Le Merite, awarded for his accomplishments during World War I as a fighter pilot. As the only recipient of the recently resurrected Grand Cross, this ostentatious order appeared to overshadow the Kaiser's Poor Le Merite. His breast was covered by glittering medals and badges, representing impressive feats of combat in another war long ago, as well as, in some instances, powerful political influence of a more recent past. Tightly gripped in his right fist was a massive, bejeweled marshal's baton. He first spoke of political topics and eventually came to the subject of the Eastern Front, at last addressing the ongoing disaster in Stalingrad. The remnants of von Paulus's Sixth Army had not yet surrendered to the overwhelming Soviet forces in the ruins of Stalingrad on the Volga. Thus, he still at this point spoke with conviction and authority. He addressed his promise to supply the beleaguered army with his Luftwaffe, a promise that we would later learn would not be kept. In his smooth tenor voice, he spoke of the sacrifices that we as young officers must face, of the perils that we must endure of the resistance that we must meet, and when the enemy has outflanked us on the right and on the left, we must hearken back to the words from antiquity. Wanderer, when you come to Sparta. Thus we listened to the gallows speech. To emphasise his words, the Reichsmarschall began pounding the podium with his baton, using such force that I was certain that at any moment I might be struck with dislodged jewels. Stalingrad wrapped within a political doctrine that abused the concepts of honour and of keeping the watch for the country, and firmly insisting that standing the ground at any price was essential, the greatest warlord of all time, our Führer in Berlin, committed an army to an agonising death in the East. As the war progressed, the extremely high casualties and the willingness of the German soldiers to offer themselves in sacrifice became an accepted norm. As the faulty leadership became exposed over an extended period of time, the willingness of the soldier to die for political beliefs began to fade, which in turn resulted in a general lessening of chances for the troops to survive the debacle of the Eastern Front. The code of honour, however, long inherent in the German soldier who stood to protect the fatherland with weapon in hand, remained within his consciousness. The soldiers continued to sacrifice their lives, not for the members of the party, but for the fatherland. The system continued to distance itself further from a humanitarian waging of the war. We remained unaware of the full extent of the orders for the liquidation and transport of Jews and other ethnic populations considered undesirable from the national socialist viewpoint, but we became fully aware of those brave men who had faithfully served their country, and who, because of a differing or conflicting political ideology, would simply disappear from our ranks. The Sports Palace speech by the Reichsmarschall brought our formal officers' training to a close, and after outprocessing and receiving new orders, we were released for several weeks' Christmas furlough. On that very same evening, I and two other war school graduates decided to remain overnight in Berlin to celebrate our newly bestowed rank and title. Three nights later, we boarded trains that would take us on our separate journeys. During several nights of reckless revelry, we had unwisely succeeded in depleting our entire officer's clothing allowance, which amounted to approximately 15 o'clock rice marks apiece. Exhausted from lack of sleep and appearing much the worse for wear, I proceeded to my hometown of Stuttgart, where I arrived destitute and still wearing an enlisted ranks uniform with newly purchased officer rank insignia hastily sewn on the shoulders. Several days later, I received, as a Christmas gift from my parents and close relatives, several officers' uniforms, complete with newly purchased dress sword and dagger, as well as the many accessories still required by the Wehrmacht officers at that early stage of the war. Germany had reached the pinnacle of military success. Our forces held vast territory in the Soviet Union. Victory appeared imminent. Despite massive odds, Rommel had consistently proven victorious against the British in Africa. We remained confident that the Sixth Army would prevail at Stalingrad, and that in the East we would eventually emerge triumphant in our crusade against Bolshevism. As a commissioned officer with combat decorations, I remained the centre of attention within my family circle. 
I spent a number of evenings with my uncle Christian, who insisted on proudly introducing his young nephew, fresh from battle in the East, to all his friends. Several years later, in September 1944, when we lay under the shadow of impending total defeat, Uncle Christian would die an agonizing death from burns received during an American air raid over Stuttgart. During the early days of January 1943, I reported to Saarburg in Lorraine, where the infantry replacement unit for my regiment was located. As I passed through the massive stone and iron gates of the former French garrison, the guard at the entrance sprang to attention and presented arms. Being a newly commissioned lieutenant, I was somewhat taken aback by the unfamiliar greeting, and I sharply returned the salute before suddenly halting to scrutinise the sentry. Looking him closely in the eyes, I realised that it was my old friend Obolus Meissner from the 14th Company. It remained a tradition in the German army for new lieutenants to pay honour to the soldier who renders the first salute following commissioning, and we arranged to meet in a local bar to discuss recent and past experiences. After reporting to the garrison administrative office, I located a number of friends from the 14th. To my surprise, Josef Vogt, Sepp Clemens, Feldwebel Weiss and Lieutenant Huber were there. My old recruit Corporal Jakob Hoenadel appeared as well. All of these comrades had been brought together as a result of wounds incurred on the front and had reported to the replacement command from various military hospitals in the area. We received the inevitable work assignments and training objectives. On the second day, the schedule demanded that we construct a circular defence point for an anti-tank position, to include the construction of tank traps and trenches. As officer in charge of this exercise, I requested an issue of necessary shovels and picks from the equipment room and learned that not a single tool was available. Even the most elementary items were non-existent or in very short supply. To fulfil the assignment, we searched for and located a large cache of new, unused tools hanging in neat rows on the wall in the basement of the garrison. Now properly prepared to conduct our training assignment, we confidently took tools in hand and, fully outfitted in combat dress, marched in ranks to the nearby training area. On our return that evening, I received the order to report immediately to the unit headquarters. There I reported as directed to a portly supply officer, whom I found perched behind a massive desk strewn with documents. I was then subjected to a ludicrous tirade concerning the unauthorised use of tools reserved strictly for air defence. Stabbing the air with a thick finger to emphasise each word, he lectured me on the importance of the tools and sharply stated that under no uncertain terms, the subject equipment was to remain in the cellar, ready and waiting for the inevitable air attack on our garrison. The picks and shovels were returned unceremoniously and without further word to the basement to hang uselessly on the wall. It is possible that they remain hanging in the cold confines of this French garrison to this day, slowly rusting and turning dark with age, yet fulfilling the duty for which they were obtained by the Wehrmacht. Having served so many months at the front among friends and comrades, it was not surprising that my days with the replacement unit were somewhat less than pleasant. This may have been due in part to my breaking with peacetime army tradition by socialising with my former enlisted comrades. Together with two other recently commissioned lieutenants, Horst Leinhardt and Hans Durmeyer, I had invited a number of the old gang from the 14th to the former residence of a French officer for an evening of drink and song. During the evening, the discussion inevitably turned to the others, the friends who remained on the northern front with our old regiment. We shared a feeling of alienation in our administrative surroundings. This was no longer our army, our environment. We belonged back at the front. Immediately following my commission, I had written to my former regimental commander, requesting that I be permitted to return to the 437th. Subsequently, the orders to report back to my old regiment were received in mid-January 1943. Together with Horst Leinhardt, I travelled in an overflowing furlough train returning to the front through Dresden, Königsberg, Kovno, Pleskai, and farther toward Tosno. As the final remnants of von Paulus's 6th Army were meeting their destiny in Stalingrad, another theatre of war arose to become priority and to draw full attention on the scale of political importance. 
Both Stalingrad and Leningrad exemplified by their names immense political, economic and spiritual significance for the communist state. Lenin, the father and spiritual leader of the Red Revolution in Russia, and Stalin, the iron ruler who, with whip and pistol, ruled the Soviet Union as a Red Tsar, had given these cities their names. Thus, the capture of these immense, heavily populated areas developed a significance far beyond simple strategic necessity, and they became rather a symbol of resistance that was to be defeated, regardless of cost, by our invading armies. Upon these two battlefields were to die hundreds of thousands. Leningrad had remained encircled by the German forces since fall 1941. On the 24th of September of that year, Hitler had withdrawn the Panzer Corps, and supporting units that had been reserved for the final assault on the city. With that move, the plans for a successful attack simply vanished. The troops could never again be assembled in such numbers and strength for a final assault against a weakened and unprepared enemy holding the city. The vital mistake in delaying an attack on the city was exemplified by the 900-day battle for Leningrad that followed. The fighting south of Lake Ladoga and on the Volchov front with which our division was involved from September 1942 to November 1943, resulted only in draining badly needed resources from which the Wehrmacht could never recover. Only in the summer months was Leningrad entirely cut off by land. As the city is situated on the west bank of Lake Ladoga, numerous small vessels were able to deliver limited supplies to the beleaguered city. From west bank to east bank, which remained under Soviet control, the lake is only about 30 kilometres wide, the approximate distance across the English Channel at Calais. The lake remained the void into which all our efforts to blockade the city were lost. The German 18th Army held a 14-kilometre wide corridor along the southern coast. The cities of Schlüsselburg and Lipka remained the cornerstones on which our flanks were anchored. This narrow, dangerous corridor, called the Bottleneck, ran through the heights of Signavino, and was otherwise flanked by trackless, impenetrable swamp. The entire southern section of this front was situated along the Neva, and the beleaguered Soviets made repeated attempts to break the ring sealing their city, and were thus applying constant pressure on our east front. At the southern end of the bottleneck ran the Kirov Road, which connected Leningrad with the Urals. Leningrad was dying. Soldiers and civilians, women, the elderly and children were perishing from the starvation our encirclement had brought upon them. Those not engaged in building positions or working in the factories did not receive rations. Those who were eligible to receive a daily ration drew two slices of bread per day. Everything burnable was consumed by the need to heat dwellings and workplaces. Anything edible simply vanished. Even wallpaper was removed from dwellings and boiled to extract minuscule amounts of nourishment from the paper and paste. Shtanov, the military and political commander, drove the population without mercy in his untiring efforts to save his city and country. Women, the elderly and young children were compelled to work in shifts for constructing the tank trenches. Those who could not work were by default condemned to die of starvation, all available food was required for those who could assist in defending the city. Production of weapons and war material continued at any cost. Tanks rolled off assembly lines almost within sight of the German troops, who remained in their positions at the very outskirts of the city. The German strategic planners had apparently underestimated the winter's effect on Lake Ladoga. The large body of water froze solid for a distance of more than 30 kilometres. Unpredictably, a road was successfully constructed over a sheet of ice one and one half metres thick, the road of survival for Leningrad. Throughout the long winter hours of darkness, heavy trucks rolled into the city, bringing only the most essential war materials. The lowest priority was food. Gasoline became almost non-existent. Stanov next constructed a rail system over the ice during the cover of darkness. After the thaw, the Soviets established a pipeline along the sea bottom to deliver fuel and electricity. The electric power from the Volchov plant on the Sphere supplied the armaments factories, which never stopped production. In September 1942, our 132D Division played a major role in the breakthrough to Gaitolovo during the first battle south of Lake Ladoga. The offensive in which the Soviets attempted to break through toward MGA 
with the goal of relieving Leningrad by land, became a catastrophic defeat for the Red Army. The Second Great Battle south of Lake Ladoga began on the 12th of January 1943, while our division was situated farther to the south on the Pogostia pocket and the Volchov. This phase of fighting rolled into our sector on the 11th of February. The White City on the Neva, the cultural pearl of Russia, the city that, until the Russian Revolution, had carried the name of Petersburg to honour the greatest Tsar, was to be freed from the German vice by a great pincer movement of the Red Army. For over two and one half years, the city of three million inhabitants, Russia's second largest, had endured the ring of German forces on the northern wing of the Eastern Front. Like Stalingrad, the city that carried the name of one of the founding fathers of Bolshevism was of primary political importance and was to be freed. In February 1943, the Soviets succeeded in breaking through the front and threatened to trap the German forces in the Oranienbaum pocket. Facing this disaster, the members of the 132D Infantry Division clung to their positions with stubborn resistance and in doing so prevented a catastrophe whose dimensions would have equaled the Stalingrad debacle. Many of my former comrades were missing when I reported to my old regiment. However, I soon felt at home again. I was immediately detailed to serve for two weeks on the Volchov front as platoon commander, which was a sector known for ever-increasing Soviet activity. The climate and battlefield conditions that we were now facing in the area south of Leningrad differed greatly from those to which we in the units from the Crimea were accustomed. The terrain was swampy, choked with thick underbrush and birch trees, interspersed with shallow rises from which an intermittent defence network could be established. During periods of warm, thawing temperatures, water would seep into all positions, making it impossible to dig deeply into the ground for shelter. In place of trenches, a system of rough log barricades piled high with earth and branches dominated our defence line. The positions could be compared to the primitive palisades once constructed by the Roman legions. A narrow rail track was laid through the swamp to enable the various positions at Pomerania, Lipovic and elsewhere to receive supplies. Other positions, such as these at Klosterdorf and Wasserkopf, were made accessible by constructing corduroy roads through the swamps from logs hewn from the dense forests. Over those narrow but effective roadways, the troops were supplied by horse-drawn wagons, and the labouring of the animals to pull their burdens over the creaking timbers could be heard throughout the hours of darkness. The wagon beds were modified to be fitted with axles and wheel rims stripped from disabled military vehicles to create a miniature rail system. Encouraged by the victories at Stalingrad and on the south wing of the Eastern Front, the Russians made vigorous attempts to put the offensives in the north into motion. During the severe winter months, it was possible for their armoured units to push over the frozen swamps, hindered only by thick stands of birch trees that prevented armoured assaults on a large scale. As a bitter cold descended on us, the Russians unleashed their offensive directly at Smyrdinia. This second battle south of Lake Ladoga began in January. Infantry Regiment 437 was transferred to the 37 Army Corps on the Volchov Front to support the defending divisions. After the sector was again stabilised, the regiment was returned to the 27 Army Corps, where it took up positions to the right of the division in the sector assigned to Group Weber. The division was responsible for defending a thinly held sector that extended along a 40-kilometre front. At the end of January, the enemy forces in the area of the Pogostia pocket became more active. Numerous reconnaissance patrols and attacks in company strength indicated that pressure was being applied in coordination with the operations conducted by the Soviets south of Lake Ladoga. No air reconnaissance was possible due to poor visibility until the 9th of February, after which large concentrations of enemy vehicles were reported traversing the roads in the Pogostia pocket. During darkness, numerous campfires were observed in the area of Senino. A change in the enemy soldiers themselves became clearly evident, as many of the positions were reinforced by large numbers of fresh troops wearing new snow camouflage uniforms and equipped with drum-fed submachine guns of recent manufacture. The division confirmed that replacements had been assigned to the enemy sector opposite us and that a renewed attack was to be expected within the next one to two days.
The attack took place on the 11th of February, in the sector of Regiment 436 units of the exhausted 96th Infantry Division, were thrown into the line and came under attack by a force consisting of 10 tanks with supporting infantry. The battle-weary, weakened regiment was unable to hold the front in the face of concentrated armour, and the enemy succeeded in breaking through. This attack was followed up the next day by enemy forces that had been reinforced with fresh troops during the night, and they penetrated to the southwest of Klosterdorf, eliminating all possibilities of a quick counterattack. The exhausted troops manning the thinly held positions were able with superhuman efforts to halt the penetration at Klosterdorf. However, as late as the 13th of February, a salient remained in the line along the wooden corduroy road that no longer could be closed. During the next two days, the enemy had crossed the Klosterdorf road and had consolidated newly won positions. The Russians attacked the positions of the 6th Battery of Artillery Regiment, 132, with armour and the troops were forced to destroy their guns before abandoning them in their positions. The weapons did fall into enemy hands, and although the barrels had been destroyed, rendering them useless to the enemy, the loss of these assets to the division and regiment was irreplaceable, and marked the first time during the war that the division had lost heavy guns, albeit temporarily, to the enemy forces. On 16 and the 17th of February, all attempts to close the gap in the line failed, Efforts to close it with battalions from the southern and western flanks were unsuccessful in penetrating the Soviet defences, which were now reinforced with the arrival of enemy tanks that remained positioned along the road. The Russians were successful in repelling all attacks until the 18th of February, when units from the 96th Infantry Division succeeded in freeing the roadway. Supported with units from the 132D, they were able to recapture the artillery positions with the now useless guns still in their emplacements. The glowing breath of battle descended with a vengeance on those who languished in the forests, swamps and undergrowth between the Volchov and Lake Ladoga. The god of war would arise with daybreak as the light began filtering through the snow, and another day of death would begin. The slumbering swamps awoke from a frozen sleep to burst into life, and as on the previous day, the noise of battle would reign throughout the white wasteland. Like a cloud spewing forth fire and steel, the morning mists would rise and spread their seeds of destruction. For nearly two weeks, the spectre of death stalked the snow-covered swamps. Each sunrise brought forth an intense barrage of artillery fire that impacted on the German positions. Mortars, heavy artillery and anti-tank guns fired ceaselessly in greeting the day. As the bursting shells slackened in tempo, the Lanzers would crawl to their positions to meet the earth-brown waves of infantry filtering through the thickets, accompanied by tanks that crushed the slender evergreen branches of pines and alder beneath the wide tracks. The overwhelming strength of the Soviets enabled them to break through several weakened sectors to penetrate the main battle line. The battle for the supply route burned fiercely. The enemy objective was to penetrate beyond the isolated defenders and strike deep into German-held territory. However, the determination of the German grenadiers, fighting to the last round, was to prevail. The Russian attack bogged down in the thick underbrush of the swamp. The snow was pockmarked with black-brown craters. Torn branches and stumps hindered any movement. It was impossible to judge where the heavy infantry support weapons could and would be brought into position. The tangled morass of ice, mud and dense forests made it impossible to determine where to establish defence positions in preparation for the next attack. During the night, the Soviets again succeeded in breaking through a sector to push through the wilderness as far as the road, only to be finally stopped by a well-concealed pack battery. The snow was heavily pockmarked with dirty brown shell craters, the trees in the thick forests broken and stripped of greenery. Downed pines created obstacles across the swampy ground. Where was it possible to bring forward the heavy infantry weapons? From where could a counter-attack be launched? Again, enemy armour penetrated our line, attempting to strike the firebase of our supporting artillery. Four of their massive steel vehicles were left burning, the remainder withdrew to the protection of the Soviet line. Following this failed attempt, they no longer limited themselves to traversing the narrow confines of the roadways, choosing to charge through the tangled wilderness rather than risk certain destruction on an obvious route. 
Our anti-tank units responded accordingly. The crews disassembled the anti-tank guns, transporting them through the swamps on the backs of men and horses to reposition them at likely defence points. Often sinking up to their hips in the icy water and snowdrifts, the infantry plunged into the forests to meet and repel the enemy. Every step required an effort. Every metre of ground drained energy from the lancers. Simple rest became a luxury. Sleep was possible only during intermittent lulls between threats of Soviet attack. Every second day the enemy threw fresh forces into the ring. They appeared as an unending flood. The benumbed grenadiers would stagger to their feet, pull together into hedgehog defences, and wait until the last second before retaliating with deadly effectiveness. The dirty grey camouflage suits hung like sodden cardboard on the aching bodies, thawing during the day only to freeze solid again with nightfall. Between firefights, the exhausted lanzers lay in the snow, with drained, colourless faces and burning eyes pressed into the saturated ground. Dark swamp water soaked through the rotting uniforms and lay icy on the skin. With the moonlight, the frost would return. From one day to the next, the situation remained the same. No sleep, no bunker or shelter, no luxury of a simple fire to warm frostbitten limbs. Muscles grew stiff and unresponsive. Feet ached in the freezing temperatures. During the pauses between firefights, our arms hung weakly at our sides. Again would come the order that would tear us to our feet. Springing from our holes after hours of crouching together in the snow, we lunged forward through twilight in response to the order to counterattack. Surging ahead, we became possessed with the intent to kill the enemy where he lay, to kill as many of the soldiers wearing the rounded whitewashed helmets as possible, to destroy those forces that threatened hourly to strike and take our own lives. With a counterattack, we momentarily gained a new life until our assault, like those of the enemy, would grind to a halt in the depths of the forest. The snow and mud weighed heavy with every step. In the pathless, frozen jungle, there were no liberating, sweeping assaults to give one the opportunity to seize the enemy by the throat. We had been thrust into hell, from which there was no escape. To surrender meant immediate death. To survive was simply to delay the inevitable. Our tortured world became surreal and unclear. The encroaching undergrowth, the snowdrifts and the splintered tree trunks hung silent with the secrets they had witnessed. Wherever the Bolshevist rage was loosed on the defenders' lines, the attack would grind to a standstill against the nameless ranks of grenadiers. The line continued to hold. The Soviet attacks repeatedly broke upon the drained, frozen and casualty decimated ranks of soldiers from East Prussia, Westphalia, Bavaria and the Rhineland. As a Soviet attack supported by tanks penetrated a thinly defended wood and ground forward toward battalion headquarters, a Prussian Feldwebel attempted to bring an anti-tank gun into the line, but remained hindered by the thick limbs and stumps that prevented him from successfully positioning the weapon. Followed by bursts from a Soviet machine gun, he fought through waist-deep snow to a nearby artillery piece, the crew of which had all become casualties moments earlier. The Feldwebel had never before laid hands on this type of weapon, and two grenadiers sprang forward to assist him. Rapidly adjusting for range and windage, he aimed and fired. It must work, and it did work. The first tank rocked to a halt and burst into flames, followed quickly by another, and for the moment the Russian attack faltered. The Soviet lines now all but surrounded the weakened and exhausted battalion, which extended like an island of resistance deep into the enemy territory. The battalion had successfully repelled the attackers, and had succeeded in keeping the supply route clear. Blackened hulks of destroyed enemy tanks along the perimeter bore mute testimony to the heavy fighting that had taken place within the narrow confines of the sector. During one night, an assault team was successful in destroying four Soviet bunkers and an enemy anti-tank position, but it became cut off and isolated in the ensuing firefight. After nine days and nights behind the enemy lines, with no rest under the unforgiving, freezing sky, Two battle-exhausted corporals reached our lines at dawn, carrying a wounded comrade. They had wrapped him in a shelter quarter, and thrusting a pole through the knotted ends, had carried him between them, moving among the enemy during the hours of darkness, burying themselves in the concealment of snowbanks during the days. 
On reaching our lines, they collapsed with exhaustion, and it was hours before they regained consciousness. Refusing an offer to be transported to the rear for rest, they then staggered to their feet and set out in the direction of their company. The following night, their company assaulted and overran an enemy bunker complex with the two men at their front, destroying the last enemy bastion in the sector. The weeks of battle in the swamps north of Smyrdinia called upon the last reserves of strength and morale. A forest war, time-consuming and slow, brought endless fighting against a vastly superior enemy of unending strength. An attempt to endure against the worst possible conditions of unforgiving nature exacted a heavy toll on the grenadiers, the artillerymen, the engineers, and the flak crews. The main battlefront continued to run along a bulge in the line held by the regiment. The 7th Company was positioned with the left wing extending from north to south within the narrow depression of the Lesna streambed. The fragile line then curved to the right with the front facing to the south, up to the forest's edge. The line then disappeared into the dense forest, running for several hundred metres in a straight line, then curving again to the right, facing the west and southwest. Within this extended salient, about 30 metres behind the line, was the company headquarters, consisting of little more than an entrenched hut covered with earth and snow. An adjustment in the defensive line had been conducted two nights previously, during which the right wing had been withdrawn, shortening the line to lessen the growing threat of being isolated and annihilated. Between the lines was a no-man's land of dense thickets and evergreens. On the 15th of February all was quiet along the line. With the silence, a sense of discomfort had descended upon the isolated platoons, holding a thin front. Seldom was it possible to hear only the deathly whisper of a winter wind passing through the treetops. Almost always did the front exhibit signs of life, be it from the occasional crack of a sniper's rifle or the methodical pounding of the Maxim positions as they probed our defences. The day before, the Soviets had probed the defences of the salient along the length of the perimeter. Wherever they would appear, one could observe the ghastly silhouettes through the thick forest and deep snow. At a distance of less than 50 metres at best, they were either destroyed or repulsed. Despite the apparent absence of the enemy, it was strongly felt that the Soviets were coming. The salient was reinforced at the expense of the left and right wings. Two heavy machine guns were brought into position and were carefully concealed in the defences. The sector where the line extended beyond the earthworks to turn sharply to the right was reinforced during the night by felling trees and stacking heavy timbers before the positions. At this location I directed that one heavy machine gun was to be situated at the turn on the line, where it would be afforded the maximum field of fire, and a squad led by an Obergefreiter positioned a light machine gun in the sector centre. The grenadiers dug in, two shivering lancers occupying each snow hole, the holes situated 10 to 15 metres apart. The night remained brutally cold following a day of heavy labour in the snow. Their feet stiff in their frozen boots, the grenadiers grew numb with cold and exhaustion. Huddled within the damp and freezing confines of the primitive earthworks, the occupants had little or no protection from the cold as it settled into the snow holes to torment them. Suddenly the heavy MG broke the silence with an ear-splitting roar, followed by a scream. Alarm! Ivan! The Obergefreiter squeezed the trigger of the MG-42, firing quick short bursts into the twilight, again joined by the heavy MG on the wood's edge. Carbines cracked between MG bursts. The low drumming of the Soviet Maxim guns responded, joined by the high, shrill blasts of the always-present Russian submachine guns. Rounds whistled through the evergreens, sending branches laden with snow to the earth, and bullets carved long telling trails in the snow, piled before the defenders' positions. The Feldwebel at the heavy MG lay prone alongside the machine gun with his carbine at his shoulder rapidly working the bolt and firing one clip after another. The entire woods swarmed with Bolshevists. We first observed them 30 metres before our position, filtering through the undergrowth, sounds of snapping branches and ice breaking beneath dozens, perhaps hundreds of heavy Russian boots. The machine guns roared and were joined by submachine guns and carbines, unheard above the pounding automatic weapons and grenade detonations. The shouts of, 
Ura, Ura, could be heard during split second lulls in the roar of gunfire. And after several seconds of firing, the shouts turned to screams as the dead, wounded, and dying collapsed in the snow before our ranks. Bodies clad in earth brown and white camouflage uniforms lay heaped in front of the machine gun positions, and more Russians filled the gaps our steaming weapons left in the charging masses. The forest before us had become a concentrated killing ground. There was no need to search out targets as the Soviets threw themselves toward our line. Jumping, dodging, shooting, screaming, they pressed forward. Despite the overwhelming terror that swept over them, the grenadiers remained in their positions, refusing to panic. As if on a training exercise, the lancers controlled and sustained their fire, able to observe the field of fire directly before the line, unconscious of what might have occurred to their right or left. Some of the carbines had fallen silent. The situation became more perilous as the Soviet attack collapsed only six metres before the muzzles of the machine guns. The forests echoed with the roar of battle for an hour. Seeing no end to the waves of attackers in sight, I desperately ordered our last reserve, a tiny squad of four men, to prepare for action. At that moment I received a plea from the platoon on our left for reinforcements. The line faced imminent collapse, although the light machine gun continued to fire incessantly, the long ripping bursts accompanied by the continual detonation of hand grenades hurled forward by the desperate grenadiers. The dead and wounded filled the forest. Our own losses remained relatively light, two dead and three wounded. Our casualties were light in proportion to the casualties we had inflicted on the enemy, but were nevertheless irreplaceable. The firing on our right flank lessened, finally falling silent as the Soviet attack ground to a halt. The defenders, consisting of four or five weary grenadiers, remained on the alert, fingers on the triggers of weapons that slowly cooled in the frosty air. Suddenly, movement was observed in the direction of the Soviet line. An extremely tall Russian rose from the snow-blanketed forest at a distance of 30 metres, shouted unintelligible commands, and motioned with a raised arm to the left. A new wave of attackers swarmed in the direction indicated. The ranks of oncoming Soviets collapsed in the fire of the heavy machine gun, and the figures tumbled to the ground, the tall Russian among them. The attack was finally broken. The Bolsheviks remained bogged in their tracks and began firing from snow holes, from behind shattered branches and ragged stumps, and from concealed positions within the evergreen forest. Slowly their fire became weaker, leaving the air filled only with the screams of their wounded, who cried and thrashed in agony before our line. For more than two hours they had thrust themselves on the fragile position defended by the grenadiers from East Prussia, the Rhineland, Bavaria, the Faltz, Baden and Württemberg. I became aware that the heavy machine gun had fallen silent and that the gunfire from carbines had slowly subsided. At the machine gun position the crew lay slumped alongside their gun. The corporal lay as if asleep behind the smoking weapon. The curved butt of the gun still pressed firmly against the shoulder of his battle smock. His head was slumped forward. The heavy whitewashed helmet rested against the smoking feed tray, where the belts of brass and copper ammunition fed into the chamber. He had been the last man in his crew. Slowly the cries of the wounded died to silence, and the stillness was broken only by the muffled sounds of Russians attempting to crawl back to their lines. Snow began to fall and I was astonished with the realisation that it was already past midday. The forest around us had taken on a new appearance during the assault. Entire trees had been downed by small arms fire. The earth lay torn and pockmarked, branches and limbs hung from ragged stumps. The evergreens in the line of fire had been stripped of foliage and appeared as bare stakes upright in the snow. The only colour to appear before our eyes in this frozen wasteland was the scarlet blood, which covered the dead and dying who lay before our guns. The Soviets began firing mortars, the hollow thump from the tubes echoing through the forest. Their attack had been repulsed only moments before our own forces would have collapsed under the waves of attackers. During the last minutes they would have broken our line, but for the fact that their strength was exhausted as well. A distance of approximately 80 metres of our line was held only by thick forests. The sound of carbine fire was no longer heard from its depths. We had repulsed the assault of a Soviet battalion, with few surviving to return to their own lines. 
We later risked sniper fire and ventured out a short distance beyond our defences to survey the carnage, and the grenadiers counted the dead. More than 160 corpses lay before the defences, most of them in front of the heavy machine gun in the earthworks on the edge of the forest and scattered before the machine gun that had been manned by the senior corporal. The body of the tall Russian who had led the last fatal assault was also found lying in the snow. Thrust in his field belt we found a Cossack dagger, apparently carried by the soldier through a number of past battles. The dagger bore a thin layer of rust, and blade and sheath were sticky with a recent coat of blood. Filed into the handle were twelve notches of obvious significance. Panzer from right, panzer from front, panzer from left. From all three directions, the Soviet armour, mostly T-34, attempted to smash through the division's defences. Regardless of how many of the steel giants exploded and burned under the murderous fire from our concealed pack positions, more always rolled forward to replace them. The front was severed through the thick forests between Klosterdorf and Smyrdinia. The sound of battle grew to a crescendo. A small combat group from Grenadier Regiment Drexel continued to hold out between the tree stumps, crouching in snow holes and behind hastily constructed log barricades. They were supported by a pack from the 14th Panzerjäger Company of Grenadier Regiment 436, commanded by Obergefreiter Kiermeyer, one of the old veterans of the regiment. Through the sound of battle, his experienced senses detected the high pitch of tank rounds coming from the right. From their position, they observed only the impenetrable maze of tree stumps, piles of frozen logs, a massed tangle of branches and roots against which any attack would falter. The farmer's son from Lower Bavaria continued to wait with the patience of a hunter, staring into the forest with the eyes of a lynx from behind the steel protection shield of the anti-tank gun. He was joined by the others in the gun crew, and they lay deathly still on the snow, attempting to penetrate the frozen jungle with their eyes. The location of the oncoming Soviet troops was at last betrayed by the movement of a steel colossus grinding through the trees. Kiermaier motioned the others to hold their fire, allowing the enemy to approach closer as the oncoming waves unknowingly proceeded into the killing zone. Behind the first tank, they discerned a second, then a third, a fourth, accompanied by ranks of Russian infantry moving ghost-like through the trees. Kiermaier remained unmoving at his position behind the gun shield, his eye now pressed to the rubber eyepiece of the gun sight. He centred the last tank in the crosshairs, and with a strong fist firmly pressed the firing button. The round exploded from the barrel of the pack, striking the tank and spraying the interior of the turret with fire and red-hot steel. A thick column of smoke rose from the burning tank as the fuel and ammunition exploded with a roar. The steel carcass effectively blocked the withdrawal route of the foremost tanks as it showered the surrounding forest with splinters and glowing ashes. Kiermaier had already drawn a bead on his next target, and with two more shots the second tank burned brightly. The other tanks opened fire with cannons and machine guns, firing blindly into the thick undergrowth, unable to locate the source of the fire. The third and fourth began to burn and explode. Another round from the hidden puck destroyed the transmission of the fifth, and the crew abandoned the tank and escaped the small arms fire to flee to the rear with the retreating infantry. This gun crew later destroyed three more tanks, a total of eight for the day. When the regimental commander received the report of the destruction of the tanks and the repulse of the enemy attack, he recommended the gun leader be awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Unfortunately, the battle group was authorised only one Knight's Cross to be awarded during this period, and the decoration was awarded to a general serving north of Smyrdinia, under General Lindemann. Kiermaier was later awarded the Iron Cross for the destruction of the tanks, which resulted in the attack being repulsed, and Oberstleutnant Drexel offered a promotion to the gun leader. Kiermaier refused the opportunity, fully aware at this point in the war that the chances of survival remained greatest for those who remained with the soldiers whom they had fully trusted and served with throughout the campaign. The promotion would have provided him a more prestigious rank. However, it might have resulted in his removal from the gun crew to serve in another capacity. On the 20th of February, infantry regiments 405 and 408 attacked from the north, 
in an attempt to cut off the enemy penetration on the Corduroy Road. The attack resulted in heavy fighting with severe losses, and in the evening the regiment succeeded in closing the gap in the line and mopping up the remaining Russian resistance. The roadway was free from point 38.9 to Klosterdorf, but our forces no longer possessed the strength to cut off and destroy any Soviet penetrations. Throughout the ten days of heavy fighting, the enemy had suffered such severe losses that an attack northward towards Smodinia was launched, and this successful offensive enabled us to stabilise the front, permitting the Corps to withdraw the badly damaged divisions from the line. On the 28th of February, Group Lindemann, badly battered and weakened by casualties, was temporarily replaced. We were advised that the infantry regiments were to be changed in name to grenadier regiments. Perhaps the high command desired to demonstrate that through the use of hand grenades in close combat, the title Grenadier would show recognition for special merit or ability in battle. It remained irrelevant to us if we were to be referred to as grenadiers or infantrymen, as our skill in using the grenades remained unchanged whether we were called grenadiers or not. Following the desperate battle in which the Soviet thrust to Gaitolovo was repelled, we were relieved from our positions by the 12th Luftwaffe Field Division and transferred to a quiet sector of the front. The newly christened grenadiers marched in long columns from the log barricades on the line over the corduroy roads that cut through the swamps toward the rear. It had become necessary to constantly change the location of the rough-hewn roads and trails as they came under frequent mortar and artillery fire when discovered by the enemy, who lay only a short distance away. The lancers marched in single file, bearing heavy equipment on their shoulders, occasionally assisted by the sturdy Siberian ponies that were always present among our ranks. The division headquarters was transferred to Poprudka, and the new division sector was concentrated around the area of Mordam. There we remained undisturbed, recovering from the ordeal of Gaitolovo, until the 30th of June, when we were again replaced by the 225th Infantry Division. This pause in activity took us to the area of Lyuban Shapki Ushaki, where we were able to concentrate on training the replacement personnel. Following the training period, the division was sent back into the line, again to a relatively quiet sector on the northwest front of the Pogostia Pocket, 